Welcome back. As the third session, we have the first symposium on recent advances in hematology, bench to bedside. I cordially invite the co-chairpersons for the session, Dr. Sarat Kularatna, Senior Lecturer in Obstetrics and Gynecology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Rukhuna, and Dr. Rohan Pulla Peruma, Consultant Hematologist, Teaching Hospital Karapitiya to the head table. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as you all know, this is the third session of the uh, first day of 80th annual academic sessions of the All Medical Association. So we are going to hear a few talks on recent advances in hematology. So we have three eminent speakers for this session, Dr. Chandima Tevara Peruma, Dr. Manu Vimala Chandra, and Dr. Nadishani Adrivikrama. Uh, here, <clears throat> you can ask questions uh, at the end of all three presentations, not at the end of the each presentation. Uh, so, when you have questions, you can type your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, you can't ask questions directly orally, or you can't type it in the uh, chat box. And if you are a panelist, you have a uh, special permission. You can uh, raise your hand and uh, unmute your mic and then you can uh, put your question. Uh, let me introduce the first speaker. She is uh, Dr. Mrs. Chandima Tevara Peruma. Uh, she is working as consultant hematologist at Ledridge Way Hospital for Children at, uh, in Kalambu. So she will talk on update on hemophilia care in Sri Lanka. Dr. Chandima, over to you. Good evening, everyone. I'm Dr. Chandima Tevara Firma, consultant hematologist at Ledridge Hospital for Children. Dr. First, I would like to thank Gaul Medical Association for giving me this opportunity to share my experience in managing hemophilia patients in Sri Lanka. Uh, is my agenda. Hemophilia. It's an X-linked recessive congenital bleeding disorder. There are two types, hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Hemophilia A is due to deficiency in factor 8 and hemophilia B is due to deficiency in factor 9. Uh, when you look at early references, the word hemophilia first appeared in a book written by Hoff in 1828. Hemophilia has been also called royal disease because Queen Victoria of England was a carrier. Two of Queen's daughters were also carriers and they passed the disease on to Spanish and Ro Russian royal families. When you look at the epidemiology, frequency is 1 in 10,000 live births. Hemophilia A is more common 80 to 85% patients are of hemophilia A. One third are due to new mutations. So males are affected as it is an X-linked disorder and females are carriers. But there are female hemophilia patients. Uh, we have about 11 in our country. And this is due to if a female carrier marries a affected male, their offspring can be a Offspring is a hemophilia patient. It's possible to be a hemophilia patient. And then the Turner syndrome and an inactivation of X chromosome, that is extreme lionization, also can give rise to a hemophilia patient. When you look at Sri Lankan data, we have 1,136 registered patients at the end of 2020 December. Out of that, 80% are hemophilia A patients and uh, hemophilia B patients, 221. And we have about 88 uh, patients with factor eight inhibitors. And our expected prevalence is 2000 when you consider the population. Uh, I think uh, about, uh, we are, I mean, we have diagnosed about 1136. This difference is due to mainly due to the mild hemophilia patients because they don't present to the hospital unless they 
uh, like uh, they get a severe bleeding episode with accident or like injury otherwise usually they don't have spontaneous bleeding so we do not see them often so they are under diagnosed uh, at the moment we have 13 hemophilia centers these centers are capable of diagnosing as well as uh, treating patients as outpatients like they have day units so they treat the patients and then they send them home so goal of hemophilia care in sri lanka is a functional cure because uh, we do not have a permanent cure uh, for that to achieve this functional cure you have to have early diagnosis very early prophylaxis before joint damage and adequate management of breakthrough bleeding. To achieve that, it's a comprehensive care. No one can single-handed manage these patients. It's a teamwork. So we have to have hematologists, medical officers, laboratory technician for diagnosis, nursing officers, social workers, then the orthopedic surgeon for like, they, some patients need knee replacements, then they come with pseudo tumors in bones for that orthopedic uh, support then psychiatrist because they have a lot of like these patients are some patients are overprotected and these kids are very aggressive sometimes so psychiat psychiatric referral sometimes we do and physiotherapy that's very important because these patients need physiotherapy, continuous physiotherapy. That is something which really we have to address on these patients. So let me begin with a case and my presentation based on this patient. So this is a master UD, is a five and a half year old boy with a family history of hemophilia A. He presented at the age of five days with an intracranial hemorrhage. So as he's having a family history, direct. Uh, directly we did the factor eight levels so it was 1.1 percent and his initial ich was treated and he was started on weekly prophylaxis that he was given 20 percent weekly at the age of one year again he presented with fits so then again i intracranial hemorrhage was suspected because when they get one episode they tend to get intracranial episodes repeatedly sometimes so suspected and 100 percent factor correction done and then ct brain was arranged which showed left-sided porencephalic cyst formation and volume loss due to previous hemorrhage there was no new hemorrhage so he was not continued on factor replacement and eeg showed abnormal epileptiform activity and so he was started on carbamazepine. This is his CT scan. You can see this large cyst formation. So uh, let me just explain about management of intracranial hemorrhage. This is very important because this is a medical emergency. If a patient, if you suspect uh, intracranial hemorrhage, don't wait for evaluation. You have to start on treatment. So first thing is treat with factor replacement and then start your evaluation if you suspect uh, an ICH. So factor replacement also you have to go for a higher value, higher levels. So usually 80 to 100 percent factor correction done. How do you calculate the correction? Is the body weight need to, if you need 100% correction, if the patient having less than 1%, so you calculate body weight into 100 and you divide by 2 for factor 8, but for factor 9, you just multiply, you don't divide by 2. And after that only you arrange imaging. Now, if the bleed is confirmed, you continue the same dose either three times a day or twice a day so it depends it's an individualized treatment you can't just say how to use it but you depending on the size of the bleed depending on the patient's uh, gcs and uh, depending if you are uh, whether you're going to whether you're planning a neurosurgery 
depending all those things, you decide on what is the, whether you are going to give eight hourly or 12 hourly. Usually first day we give eight hourly. In other countries, they do the factor levels, but we are unable to perform factor levels that frequently. So what we do is we, uh, we try to give eight hourly first day, and then next day, depending on the response, depending on patient's uh, clinical condition and size of the bleed, you reduce it to twice a day because fact eight half-life is eight to 12 hours. And then the continuation, the same dose, you continue four to seven days. That's also, you decide, in, that is all these are individualized. So you decide on, depending on the size of the bleed and patient's consciousness, in response to therapy. So after that, you reduce the dose and continue up to 14 days daily dose we have to give. But after that, whether you're going to give for 21 days depends on patient's condition again. So you can stop it at 14 days and start on prophylaxis or you continue for 21 days. So anyway, after intracranial hemorrhage, they should be on uh, continuous prophylaxis. So what is prophylaxis? Prophylaxis is a regular intravenous injection of factor concentrate to in order to prevent bleeding. So in the objective of our prophylaxis to convert a person with severe hemophilia to a moderate or, mi moderate or mild hemophilia. So we have to maintain uh, factor levels above one to 3% at all times, because if it is a, mild moderate hemophilia it has to be above one one percent to make it a mild hemophilia above five percent so it depends on your availability of factor at least they should be they should have above one percent factor levels to prevent spontaneous bleeding but sometimes they can develop even moderate hemophilia patients presence with spontaneous bleeding so it has to be uh, maintained above that level so there are different regimens. So high dose prophylaxis, that is 50 to 80% correct, correction every two days. That is not possible in, in a country like ours. So intermediate dose prophylaxis is 30 to 50% correction three days per week. And low dose is 20 to 30% correction two to three days per week. So what we do is we give low dose prophylaxis that is also main most of the time we give once a week and some patients depending on their bleeding we increase to two days per week so always that is also individualized especially for very small children you have to start with less intense prophylaxis like once weekly infusions and gradually increase the frequency depending on their bleeding because venous access issues are there and for them to accept this when you start on prophylaxis it's it's uh, iv injection so some kids are really uh, scared of injection so for them to get to used to it usually you start it once a week and then slowly if they're presenting with bleeding then you increase your frequency at least for twice a week in a country like Hours if their frequency of uh, bleeding is high. And other important thing is you have to round up your uh, dose to the nearest vial size. Now, if it is 200 and if the vial is 250 international units and your dose when you calculate it, calculate it if it is 200, but you give 250 like uh, that, if they're taking the vials home and taking it from outside. Because some patients, we issue factor 8 vials for them to have it at home and inject from the nearby GP. Or if the parents are capable, they can give it at home. Some parents are doing it. And young adults, they inject by themselves. So those things are possible. So you have to calculate the nearest vial size. And then, uh, but when they come to the, our unit, 
as we are sharing it, we use the correct dose because we can share the vials with the other patients. We get them down on one day for prophylaxis. So like uh, two or three days we have, uh, for, we get them down for prophylaxis and so they can, then, then we share the vials. So when, when I come back to my patient, he presented, then he, at the age of two years, he started presenting with recurrent episodes of bleeding. Then we did the uh, inhibitor screening and FACT8 inhibitor was detected. And we did Bethesda levels, it was 34. Then we had to, if they have inhibitors, we have to stop prophylaxis. If we stop the prophylaxis and we repeated the inhibitor levels three months later. His bleeding episodes were managed in between with activated prothrombic complex concentrate, which is called APCC. So what are, these, what are those inhibitors? When hemophilia patients are exposed to factor concentrates that they are missing, their immune system may see it as foreign protein and develop neutralizing alloantibodies called inhibitors. There are low theta inhibitors where the uh, Bethesda level is less than five Bethesda units. They may be transient and disappear spontaneously without specific management within six months of initial documentation. But for bleeding, uh, if these patients present with bleeding, you can use a higher dose, like usually threefold higher dose to arrest bleeding, but you can use fact eight. And you have, but you have to monitor closely for anamnesia. Now, if a patient needs 40% correction for a joint bleed, we have to give 120% correction in a patient with low dose inhibitor. High dose inhibitors are when the Bethesda unit is more than high Bethesda units. For minor bleeding, you have to use, uh, you, you can try with local hemostatic measures, tranexamic acid. But if they fail, we have to, or inadequate, we have to use bypassing agents like APCC or recombinant factor 7A. So you can look at that uh, FIBA has 2, 7, 9, 10, inactivated form as well as activated form. It's a bit thrombogenic because it acts at several places bypassing factor 8. Recombinant factor 7A acts uh, it's in the tissue, fa uh, tissue factor pathway. It will directly activate factor 10A, but FIBA acts at several places. So to arrest uh, form clot formation, and it, it is a bit thrombogenic, therefore. So when they develop inhibitors, uh, uh, usually we have to try to eradicate these inhibitors. But that, what we use is immune tolerance induction, which is called ITI. That is regular infusions of variable doses of factor A. And you have to administer for months to years to tolerate them. So there are several protocols. There's a high dose regimen where you use 200 international units per kg daily. And low dose regimen you use 25 to 50 international units per kg three times a week. So uh, what we usually do is three times a week low dose regimen because uh, daily it's very difficult to use daily in small kids because of the venous access issues. If we have to use daily, we have to have a central line port inserted for these kids. So most of the time we try to use uh, low dose regimen. So in our, for our patients, four months after the diagnosis, we started him on ITI and we used extended half-life factor. Uh, we got, it's a recombinant product and we got that as a donation. So we started using it on him and we used the low dose regimen where he has to come three times a week for injections. So just to explain you the these extended half-life products, there are several products for factor eight, but increase in half-life is only one and a half times. For factor nine, it is three to five fold. Now, if you are using this product for prophylaxis, still for ideal prophylaxis, we have to use uh, 
once uh, twice a week at least but for factor nine you can use it uh, once a week because there's a three to five fold increase in half-life so iti was continued for about two years but he did not respond i mean we we monitored his beta cell levels he did not respond and we decided to stop his iti and during this period he presented with multiple bleeding episodes so these episodes were managed with apcc and due to limited resources we couldn't start him on apcc prophylaxis so in some other countries they start them on apcc prophylaxis but uh, we couldn't start him on but luckily he didn't develop any intracranial hemorrhages uh, recurrent intracranial hemorrhages only the soft tissue hematomas and joint bleeds so uh, uh, what are the other options available for a patient like that then comes this uh, newer therapy non-factor therapy called emisuzumab this is a bispecific monoclonal antibody that bridges activated factor 9 and 10 to replace the function of missing factor 8. So it's like uh, this is factor 8 and this is emisusumab. It's just like that. It bridges the activated factor 9 and 10 and it's activate factor 10A. So these inhibitors will not act on emisusumab as it is not factor 8. So uh, several uh, trials have gone through, uh, this drug has gone through several trials. And uh, uh, this is uh, this was published in New England Journal of Medicine, where they, they have shown that uh, in this trial, there's a marked reduction in uh, bleeding episodes. And uh, due to uh, after starting emisuzumab prophylaxis, these are the patients who were not given emisuzumab prophylaxis. And this is the these are the patients who were given uh, APCC in the past and then switched on to emisuzumab prophylaxis. So it's nicely seen that uh, uh, there's a marked reduction in bleeding episodes. The main problem with this drug is it's thrombogenic, but mainly if you use with the uh, APCC. Because in these uh, two trials, uh, Haven 1 trial, that was the first trial, they encountered uh, thrombotic microangiopathy and venous and arterial thrombosis uh, in patients who were exposed to APCC. And other minor side effects like injection site reaction, headache, joint bleeds were there, joint pain. But main worrying is the thrombotic microangiopathy and venous arterial thrombosis so for our patient we started him on emisusumab it's given subcutaneous so it's uh, there's an ad added advantage of uh, because no need of venous access and when you are using that you have to use low first the loading dose that you have to give weekly subcutaneous injection after that maintenance dose once in two weeks but later on like because he was uh, because of the covid uh, they were unable to come to the hospital frequently so we decided to go to once in four weeks regimen but uh, you have to give injections to four sites but later on he accepted it he said it's okay for him so uh, now he's on once in four weeks regimen and now he's very active and leads a near normal life because i call it near normal still we can't allow them to go for contact sports high risk situations because usually when you give emisusumab their factor levels like it's not the factor levels but it's equivalent to 30 percent factor levels uh, their protection so therefore like you can't ask them to go for that sort of games like contact sports but they can run around and play and he's very happy and he never he after starting his bleeding was zero so this is him i'm showing him with the permission from him he just he used to come mainly with this uh, sort of a hematomas 
because he's very naughty. And management of then the breathing episodes while on emesusumab. These patients, uh, very, these patients, if they're having inhibitors, prefer to give recombinant factor 7A over APCC. As I told you earlier, it, uh, APCC, if you give with emesusumab, there's a risk of thrombotic microangiopathy. But if recombinant factor 7A is not available, then the maximum dose which you can give is 100 IU per kg per day of APCC. That is also one day you can use it, but you have to monitor uh, for thrombotic microangiopathy. And without in patients without inhibitors, if you are using emesusumab, uh, you can manage with factor eight. And the patients who are going for surgery on patients who are on emesusumab also, you can manage with factor eight if they do not have inhibitors. This is another patient whom we managed a minor surgical procedure uh, who was on emesusumab. He's a nine year old boy. He is also on emesusumab once in four weeks regimen. And he had a cut injury to his thumb two weeks after his emesusumab dose. He did not have any excessive bleeding, so mother took him to a local hospital for a dressing. But his wound was not very healthy, so he needed some surgery at our hospital, and we referred to the surgeon. And then surgeon surgeon said, like, if the if uh, I mean, for us to manage the, his hemostasis, then he can do the surgery. We did APTT; it was normal, but. You can't rely on APTT if the patient is on emesusumab. Therefore, we did Rotem and it was also normal. So we decided for him to go ahead with the surgery without any factor replacement. And this is after surgery. He didn't have any bleeding and he was discharged from the hospital next day. So when you look at our patient number, uh, we have 32 patients on emesusumab and uh, we have uh, 22 positive for, out of them 22 are patients with inhibitors 10 are without inhibitors these patients were selected because of one i think one or two had high uh, intracranial bleeds and others were having very high bleeding rate in spite of uh, prophylaxis for two to three times per week so they were selected because of that. And then we have uh, on ITI, five patients. And there are two patients who have failed ITI. And ITI completed four and still to start 11. This ITI completed patients, still they have to get a small dose of factor eight. Otherwise, I mean, they have, I mean, their tolerance can, they can lose their tolerance. So it's always, we have to give a small dose. We continue to, we continue to give their prophylaxis a very small dose uh, to keep the tolerance. And other thing is whether to start ITI or not in these 11 patients. That is the issue because uh, in other countries also, they are discussing on that whether it's needed or not. But always, uh, like, we are depending on uh, this donation. I mean, we this emesusumab is a donation we have got from the World Federation of Hemophilia. So we don't know how long we are going to get the donation. So as the donation is going on, it's always better for us to start on immune tolerance and see whether we can, if, whether they can achieve the tolerance. So if they achieve it, it's easy for us because we can manage their bleed, intercurrent bleeding episodes. Anyway, these kids, they come with falls and those things. So it's for easy for us to manage their bleeding episodes with factor eight. And other thing is that's the best thing. It's always better if you can manage their bleeding with factor eight than APCC or factor seven. So therefore we have to start on these patients also uh, immune tolerance in near future. For our patients who failed ITI, we can't do anything else. So anyway, we have to uh, wait for, we have to depend on emesusumab 
and factor 7 for their bleeding. Now, this is another patient. This is a nine year old boy. He, he had this target joint and he was in pain. He was always coming uh, like every week they're coming to us. And then when we started this and he couldn't walk, the father had to carry him. But after starting, just six weeks after starting, he was his uh, swelling reduced and he started walking. Now he's quite well running around, doing swimming as exercises and he's quite happy with the drug. So it's the, I mean, this is because of a donation, we are able to give it to the patient, but this is the best treatment available in the world. So our patients are also getting the best options available in the world at, in the world at the moment. So is there a hope for a cure? That is the other part. Now we are aiming at functional cure, but others are aiming at permanent cure. That is the gene therapy. So they are, the, they are trying to replace the dysfunctional gene with exogenous functional gene. <laughs> so for that, uh, they have done series of trials and uh, human, human trials even in phase three now. That is the transfer genes through adenovirus associated virus, viral vector, where they have incorporated the therapeutic DNA to the adenovirus and inject it. And then this uh, virus will go into the liver cells and release the DNA, where the DNA will form an episome and produce factors. So that's it's in trial stage, and we are also trying to incorporate few of our patients to this trial at the moment. That's for the adults. So these are few of my patients who are on emisuzumab, and they are very happy about their uh, product, and because they are getting the best treatment option at the moment available in the world for these patients with inhibitors. So thank you very much for listening and uh, I hope all of you all when you encounter these hemophilia patients, you will manage them like they will come to you uh, after a fall or that thing. So you have to address them. I mean, you have to treat them quickly. Otherwise, their joint will get affected if the like if you do not treat them adequately and quickly so once again thank you very much for listening and i'm happy to take up any questions if you have so thank you very much dr chandima for your uh, update and how do we manage uh, patients with hemophilia in the uh, current era so as we mentioned before you can uh, put your questions into Q&A box and the questions will be answered at the end of the session. Let me introduce the second speaker, Dr. Manu Vimalachandra. He is a lecturer in pathology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. He will be talking on state of art Hematology in diagnostic and treatment. Over to you, Dr. Ma. Good afternoon. Uh, I would like to thank the Golden Medical Association for their kind invitation to be a part of their annual academic sessions this year. So in the next uh, 25 minutes, I'll be uh, talking to you about some new developments that occurred in the past two decades in the field of hematology under the title Hematology State of the Art. So the areas I'll be talking to will be next generation sequencing, gene editing, and cellular therapy. So the, when you talk about next generation sequencing, 
we can go back to how it all started, the evolution of genetic diagnosis. We can go right to the beginning where the discovery of the optical microscope, where people actually tried to look at the, uh, the microscopic features within a cell. Then the landmarks were the dis description of the laws of inheritance by Mendel, the description of the uh, DNA structure by Watson and Crick. And in the late 1950s, uh, the description of the number of chromosomes in the human cell through the demonstration of a karyogram or a karyotype. Then Sanger sequencing came into being in 1970s, which was further facilitated by the development of PCR, a form of amplification of DNA. And towards the 1990s, the late 1990s and the early 2000s, this concept of next generation sequencing came into being. So next generation sequencing is not a, a single test. It's a sort of a catch-it-all term that uses several newer DNA sequencing technologies, which uses different platforms, different machines. But essentially what they all do is that they are able to sequence large amount of data in a massively parallel manner so that at the end of the day you have a very cost effective and a, a quick test to give you information on the sequence of areas of dna uh, now like i said there are so many different platforms but what is common to all platforms or the general principles of it would be uh, the spatial separation or the sample preparation, amplification, parallel sequencing, and bioinformatics. Now, I don't have the time or the expertise to go into detail about next generation frequency sequencing, but to very briefly explain what it is. So if you look at Sanger sequencing, which is still the gold standard of uh, sequencing, it essentially uses, uh, you have a particular part of DNA, which you need to find out what the sequence is, sequence of the nucleotides are. Uh, you have a primer and to which you add dideoxynucleotides, which are fluorochrome tagged. And when these are added, they will stop at different levels. So at the end of the day, you will have lots of lots of oligonucleotides that are separated through uh, capillary uh, through capillary electrophoresis and on that capillary electrophoresis you'll have the different colors and de depending on the colors you'll be you'll be able to identify the sequence of that dna now the difference in when it comes to next generation sequencing is like i said before first you have to make the samples or you call that preparation of a DNA library. So in fragments of DNA with adapter molecules on either side of them, these molecules are fixed to a solid phase uh, depending on the platform. And from there it is amplified. And this into this amplified DNA is added again fluorochrome labeled nucleotides. And they will bind in the presence of other polymerases and so on, bind to the DNA. And at the end of the day, you will have an image like this, which through the camera, you can identify the sequence. So you have large amounts of DNA sequences coming out. In order to make sense of this DNA sequence, you need what is called bioinformatic pipelines. Essentially, what they do is they take a particular DNA sequence and compare it with a reference DNA to find out what is what it is most likely to be or what it resembles the most. Now, I'd like to take from the field of hematology, the inherited bone marrow failure syndromes uh, to demonstrate how NGS has changed, how we diagnose and manage, this, manage these conditions. Uh, very broadly, we can divide the inherited bone marrow failure syndromes to the syndromes that are caused due to defective DNA repair. Example is Fanconi anemia. Then you have the telomeopathies, defective telomerase activity or failure to maintain the telomere lens. And the exa example is dyskeratosis congenita, where there is sort of fast forward aging. And then you have the ribosomal pathies like diamond back fan anemia and Schwarzman diamond syndrome. And then there's a whole mixed bag of 
uh, other bone marrow failure syndromes, particularly of affecting uh, certain cell lines like the megakaryocytes or the neutrophils. Uh, a common feature to all of these is that they end up with MDS or ML. And also they have multi-system uh, involvement, so lots of defects and abnormalities and other systems as well. Now, the, uh, the, the basic way or, or the, the usual way, or the usual approach towards a patient like this would be when a patient presents with bone marrow failures, commonly a pediatric patient, but not always. Uh, sometimes there might be a family history and you do a thorough physical examination and you might see, find out these features, skin rashes, sleep abnormalities and so on. And then you suspect, could it be Fancori's anemia? Then you do a chromosome fragility test to demonstrate the defective DNA repair in this patient. And if it is possible, positive, you go on to perform uh, a specific DNA, DNA sequencing. Now, as time got, went on, they, they had found no, more and more amount of uh, gene mutations, particularly when it comes to Fanconi anemia, it, it's about 15 mutations. So the next step of this would be to do what is called NGS panel. So a panel that will look at all the possibilities uh, of all the different bone marrow failure syndromes. So typically a panel will have about 90 to 100 genes analyzed and the results will be available in about two weeks time. And the cost of it will be uh, about 50 to 60,000 rupees. Uh, this is a paper that was published in um, earlier this year from Australia, where they looked at 115 patients who presented with uh, possible inherited bone marrow failures. And they, uh, on, on these patients, so they went through the uh, traditional approach of uh, history examination and the traditional screening test we talked about. And then uh, they did the NGS panel, which we, which I showed to you before, about 90 to 100 genes. And what they found out after doing this NGS panel is 30 out of 115. So almost one fourth of the patients, the diagnosis completely changed. So that, I think that emphasizes or kind of highlights how uh, NGS has an impact on the diagnosis of these different conditions. What about treatment, the choice of treatment? So if you have a more precise diagnosis, the choice of treatment will, will be more precise. You can give targeted therapy, uh, especially when it comes to immunodeficiencies. Most of these uh, bone marrow failures will require hemopoietic stem cell transplant, but not always. Even supportive care. Uh, recently, there was a child who with a bone marrow failure with a particular mutation called uh, SAMD9. In this particular mutation, uh, there is, in addition to bone marrow failure, there's an element of immunodeficiency as well. So when he presented with neutropenic sepsis, in addition to treating with uh, antibiotics and antifungal, we also did uh, 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 immunoglobulin levels, and it was found to be extremely low. So in addition to the conventional uh, method of managing neutropenic sepsis, uh, we also uh, treated it with immunoglobulin replacement, which finally um, resulted in a good outcome. Then if the treatment is hemopoietic stem cell transplant, finding an optimal donor. Now, the ideal donor for any hemopoietic stem cell transplant would be a matched sibling donor. However, when you know the patient has a particular type of mutation, we can see if that particular mutation is also present in the sibling because the sibling can be completely normal, morphologically completely normal with normal blood count, but still harboring that particular mutation. So if you transplant the patient with that sibling, the patient is eventually going to end up with the same uh, diagnosis. Then when you find a proper donor, uh, choosing the optimal conditioning regime. And because these conditions bone marrow failure syndromes have a multi-organ involvement. They will have increased risk of lung fibrosis, secondary malignancies. We can fine tune the chemotherapy or the radiotherapy we give in the conditioning to have minimal risk depending on the particular organ involvement of that particular syndrome. Then identifying 
uh, at risk family members. We can do family screening, family counseling. And once we found uh, which family members are at risk and the patient, we can have uh, disease specific surveillance. So screening again for lung fibrosis or secondary malignancies can be uh, and done in a very systematic manner when you know what particular mutation that patient is harboring. Right, so moving on uh, from next generation sequencing to cellular therapies, uh, I always talk, start the talk with the story of this little girl called Emily Whitehead. So she's a girl from Philadelphia who was diagnosed with B acute lymphoblastic leukemia in 2001, 2002, somewhere around that time. Uh, as you probably know, uh, ALL has a very good prognosis in children with 80 to 90% cure rates. Unfortunately, Emily fell into the category of the unlucky 10% where she was resistant towards the first line of treatment. So she received a second line of chemotherapy, which she was resistant to as well. Uh, now, even to pro proceed towards a bone marrow transplant, you need to get some sort of disease control. So the only options available for her at that point was palliative care. But in that particular hospital, the Philadelphia Children's Hospital, there was a clinical trial. They were trying out this new treatment called CAR T cells, where they were using the patient's own immune system to fight malignancies, which has never tested in humans. So she was enrolled in that trial. Uh, before we come to this CAR T cells, uh, something called immunosurveillance. What is immunosurveillance? Basically, it is a very important function of our immune system that is to recognize and irradiate tumor cells when they occur inside a normal human being or, or any living being for that matter. Now, we know malignancies are common in immune deficiency people. However, majority of tumors do occur in people who are immunocompetent which tells us that the tumors probably try uh, very smart methods to evade the immune system from this natural surveillance system. And one of the ways is to hide from the immune system so that they are not recognized. So that's where the CAR T cells come and CAR T therapy comes from the, the name, it stands for chimeric antigen receptor, T cells. So chimera, as you know, is an animal who has the head of a lion, um, the tail of a snake and the body of the goat or so on and so forth. But essentially what happens is, so you have the patient's T cell, which is um, not recognizing the tumor cells. To that, uh, genetically, they, through the use of a viral vector, they insert a new T cell receptor. So essentially this T cell is a chimera now. It doesn't have its original T cell receptor, but it has a modified T cell receptor. How is this T cell receptor modified? It is uh, specifically designed to recognize the B uh, lymphoblast. So CD19 is a surface molecule that is found on B lymphoblast. And this new T cell receptor is, uh, is able to bind to it bind to the CD19 molecule. Not only does it bind specifically to CD19, the receptor is modified further to make its natural killing ability more potent. So we have a more potent and more specific T cell. So how is this made? So you have the patient, the patient undergoes leukopheresis, just as you have plasmapheresis and so on. And you take out the T cells and the T cells are manipulated in vitro uh, using viral vectors. They are inserted with this new T cell receptor, then they are expanded. And once they're expanded, they are put back into the patient. Now it was a huge deal at that point. Uh, the journal Science cost, called it the cancer immunotherapy. And it was a huge deal for this little girl who responded completely. And she went on to find uh, found this um, foundation called Emily Whited Foundation, 
which raises money for cellular therapy, specific cancer research involving cellular therapies. So if you go to the website, you'll see everywhere she puts a, a picture which says she's free of cancer. So she's now nine years free of cancer. Her efforts as a cancer survivor and as a person who raises money for cancer research were recognized by the president of the United States. And it so happened that she went, she was invited to see him on a Tuesday and President Obama, being the cool guy he is, uh, gave an excuse letter to the teacher, uh, excusing because she was with the president. Right, so where are we now? Um, it has come a long way, almost 10 years for the CAR T cells now. So uh, BLL, as I mentioned, has a very good response rate, but this is short-lived. So this is this can be used as a bridge towards hemopoietic stem cell transplant. Then the main use right now uh, is in the B lymphoma. So one third of B cell lymphomas um, consist of diffuse large B cell lymphomas, and you have about 80% overall response rate. And in a, more than half the patient, this response is maintained. Remember, all these diseases are not de novo. These are refractory, relapsed refractory ones. So they have undergone multiple, multiple lines of chemotherapy. And only when they are resistant to multiple lines of chemotherapy can they be eligible for this experimental, very costly treatment. So uh, if you think of uh, multiple myeloma, uh, there's a 73% response rate. So these are patients who have got uh, six, seven, or even nine to 10 lines of chemotherapy before being treated by CAR T cells. So these are, I mean, these are good numbers if you, if you are a patient who has gone through all of that. Right. So what is the future? What holds the future for CAR T cells? So CAR T's uh, are, they are trying to make them even smarter and even better. So two essential features of these CAR T cells. One is their ability to kill the tumor cell, the tumor silical activity. So that can be enhanced, not only using the T cells ability to, to kill the tumor, but also using the surrounding cells. So the trucks are a form of new CAR T cells where uh, not only the T, T cell, the CD8 positive T cell, but it also secretes cytokines so that it, it uses all the other uh, elements of the immune system as well to fight the tumor cells. Now, <clears throat> off the shelf cars, which is a big hot topic. Now, the type of cars we discussed before are what are called autologous CAR T cells. So you have the patient's own T cells being taken out and shipped to a lab about hundreds of thousands of miles away and it's manipulated and amplified there and it has to come back again thousand miles uh, to the patient. So this takes a long time. So there can be mishaps in between. So what if you had allogenic cars or off the shelf cars? Uh, you can just give those CAR T cells as you would give a normal blood transfusion. Uh, so all of the previous CAR cars were T cells, but now the NK cells are also being tested and they have their own advantages when compared to a T cell. Cost and availability. Uh, the main criticisms, one of the main criticisms of um, CAR T cells is that the huge cost. If you take the cost not only to manufacture the, uh, the CAR T's, but from the point of um, the decision to administer the whole workup to give the CAR T's and to administering it finally and the follow up, the, the cost is about 350,000 US dollars. However, Japan and China are now uh, coming to the market and uh, sorry, China and India and uh, India have actually said they are ready to recruit their first uh, patient to their CAR T trial this year. And they say they'll be able to afford uh, to give this treatment for a cost of 50,000 USD which is essentially the price of an uh, allogenic stem cell transplant. So a treatment uh, which is sort of science fiction is really now at our doorsteps and our patients should be able to uh, hopefully uh, access this very uh, uh, interesting treatment. Coming on to the last topic, which is gene editing. 
This is a paper, a landmark trial that was published in the New England Journal of Medicine earlier this year, where the results of gene editing uh, in two patients, one with sickle cell anemia and the other one with beta thalassemia was published. And these patients, the one with sickle, had uh, about two, uh, more than three uh, acute sickle cell crisis per year, whereas the uh, beta thalassemia patient was receiving at more than 10 transfusions. So what is shown in the screen were the eligibility criteria. Uh, so what is gene editing? So gene editing essentially tries to correct an acquired or congenital genetic defects. There are may, many platforms that you can use it, uh, that you can use to do this, but CRISPR-Cas9 is the most popular platform that is kind of coming above the other, other platforms. So what is CRISPR-Cas9? CRISPR-Cas9 is actually an endonuclease, which cuts the DNA. So it basically cuts it like a scissor, uh, and it is tagged to an RNA, which guides it to where it should go. So it is originally coming from a bacteria. It's a sort of a uh, uh, immune response of a bacteria towards a viral infection. But uh, the CRISPR-Cas9, like I mentioned, is uh, endonuclease, endonuclease, and to the endonuclease is tagged and guide RNA. So once uh, in vitro uh, to a stem cell, this is uh, administered, the guide RNA will take the endonuclease to that particular uh, gene that needs to be corrected. And what the CRISPR-Cas does is it causes cuts or it cuts the uh, DNA. And uh, once there's a double standard break, the natural tendency of the cell is to repair itself. So the cell keeps on repairing and the DNA endonucleus keeps on cutting the double standard break till it repairs itself. So once it repairs, the endonuclease stops cutting. And then you have essentially a stem cell that has been completely corrected. And this can be re-administered to the patient if it's a hemopoietic stem cell. Uh, the patient will need some sort of conditioning like a bone marrow transplant, and they will uh, receive something like an autologous transplant. So that is what happened to those two patients, the sickler and the beta thalassemia patient. For the description of this uh, very, very exciting uh, CRISPR-Cas9 system, these two scientists received the Nobel Prize for Chemistry last year. So if you look at the uh, results, the sickle cell patient who started with a hemoglobin of about eight at the end of 18 months had gone up to 40. And the sickle cell patient who had HBS consisting about 74% of, of, of all the uh, hemoglobin uh, went down to 52. So she was converted from a sickle cell disease to uh, a sickle cell trait. And there were no acute crisis for this patient during this follow-up period. And this patient obviously did not require any blood transmissions. So what are the other uses? So two monogenic hematological disorders I mentioned, uh, sickle cell anemia and beta thalassemia. Uh, hemophilia B is another area where there's lots of interest. Uh, there's actually a few Sri Lankan patients also now worked up to be enrolled in one of these trials from the National Hospital of Sri Lanka. And uh, Immunodeficiencies, there's lots of monogenic disorders with immunodeficiencies that gene therapy is used. Then uh, CAR T cells, the CAR T cells we discussed. So all the fancy changes that you can do to the T cell receptor can be, uh, can be done using this CRISPR-Cas system. HIV, another exciting area where gene therapy is used. So they try to get rid of the receptor that is required for the HIV virus to enter or infect the cell. Mucopalysaccharidosis is uh, another disease where there's most recent trial data coming out where the cells were infected with the viral vector that resulted in the editing of the gene. Right, so what are the challenges? Uh, one is off-target editing. So it's all well and good if it goes and corrects the right place. But I mean, while correcting the hemoglobin, it also takes out the 
uh, phagocytic activity or a neutrophil, I mean, that's not something that you would desire. Then achieving sustainable cell populations in vivo is difficult of the genetically modified cell because obviously you want 100% of that uh, cell working, uh, which can be a challenge. Most of the hemopoietic uh, stem cells that are edited will require myeloablation. So all the complications of an autologous transplant will also be there when there's gene edit. Ethical issues, it's a huge, huge problem, which was highlighted uh, when uh, there was uh, embryonic gene editing uh, by uh, Chinese scientists. Surprise, surprise there. But uh, so what he actually did was the these two twins, twin girls were born uh, whose mother was HIV positive and he manipulated the embryo so that they would not be infected. He claimed that it was successful, but, but it opens up doors to uh, ethical issues. So basically you can end up creating superhumans. Probably they have already, who knows? And you'll end up like something like what happened in Jurassic World, where they made this very super nasty dinosaur called the Dominus Rex, putting together all the nasty features of all the dinosaurs, including the pit viper venom of our own green pit viper. Right, so I think that comes to the end of my uh, short talk. Once again, thank you for your patient listening and the very kind invitation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mano, for a very comprehensive talk on behalf of the DMA and the DMA committee. So we are coming to the last uh, part of our symposium, and that will be done by Dr. Nadishani Drivikrama. Uh, she's a consultant hematologist and working at Castle Street Hospital for Women, Kalam. So over to you, uh, Nadishani. Good evening, everyone. Let me first of all thank All Medical Association for inviting me to deliver a talk on obstetric hematology. So when I was looking for a topic, I thought it would be interesting to talk on hematological manifestation of COVID-19 infection and how it changes during pregnancy, as it's a hot topic these days. So. It's no need to say that COVID-19 has become a global pandemic and it's caused by SARS-CoV-2. And up to 1st of September, uh, our, uh, uh, total exceeding 217 million cases were reported globally and the deaths exceeded 4 million. And up until 31st of August in Sri Lanka, uh, total of uh, uh, cases exceeding 400,000 were reported and the death toll reached 9,185. Uh, this included 28 maternal deaths. And you all know that uh, most of these affected individuals are asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic. Only one-fifth of them become severely ill and 2 to 5% will die. And they die of complications, particularly uh, with regard to uh, pulmonary uh, uh, system, uh, respiratory system, and also they might uh, experience complications related to hematology, neurology, cardiac, or renal complications. And it is found that uh, this virus enters the body via angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors, which is more prevalently found in lung tissue. And moving on to hematological manifestations, there are many publications discussing <coughs> hematological manifestations of COVID-19 infection. And this uh, recent review article that appeared in uh, uh, European Hem uh, Journal of Hematology discusses many hematological manifestations. Of them, I would like to discuss further on 
cytopenias and coagulopathies mainly. So my talk uh, will be on, uh, I will be discussing on cytopenias, coagulopathy, plus or minus thrombosis, in the sense coagulopathy may be associated with thrombosis or not. And finally, I would like to touch briefly on VITT, even though it's not related to COVID-19 infection. Since uh, with the ongoing vaccination program, I thought it would be timely to discuss a few things about vaccine-induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis as well. So moving on to thrombocytes and cytopenias, the commonly reported cytopenia is lymphopenia. In many, uh, uh, in many uh, uh, articles, they discussed about lymphopenia. And also, the next common list would be from the cytopenia, which is again mild. Anemia is also reported, however, it does not have a much of a clinical significance and usually mild. And this review article, uh, submitted by a Sri Lankan group, appeared in American Journal of Tropical Medicine recently, uh, analyzes recent evidences of uh, with regard to hematological manifestations and came to these conclusions. Uh, they also found lymphopenia as the commonest hematological manifestation, and then about 20 to 40 uh, percent has had leukopenia as well, and a smaller population uh, proportion has had leukocytosis, particularly neutrophil leukocytosis. And neutrophil leukocytosis is uh, not uh, something to be surprised because when secondary bacterial infection sets in or when cytokine storm is there with the massive inflammatory when there's massive inflammatory response you can get neutrophil leukocytosis and also they have uh, seen uh, 5 to 21 percent of patients were getting thrombocytopenia and as uh, i said earlier thrombocytopenia was mild so how do they get lymphopenia so uh, there are many uh, mechanisms that they describe. The most favored one is lymphocytes too ha have ACE2 receptors. So why are these receptors? Lymphocytes may enter uh, the, uh, into, into the cells and thereby may cause apoptosis and uh, invasion of the reticular endothelial system may cause uh, destruction of uh, lymphocytes. So you may experience metabolic acidosis in a COVID-19 infection and raised lactic acid levels are known to cause reduced proliferation of lymphocytes. The primarily affected organ is lung, so lymphocytes may traffic towards the lung, causing peripheral blood lymphopenia. Uh, also, there are so many evidence suggest, uh, uh, suggesting or showing the strong association between lymphopenia and severity of COVID-19 infection. In turn, it's associated with uh, the prognosis. The next commonest is thrombocytopenia. And again, this is associated with higher the, uh, high risk of mortality. So this study evaluated uh, the thrombocyte degree of thrombocytopenia among survivors and non-survivors and compared so this continuous line represents the non-survivors, whereas this uh, light-colored line shows survivors. So you can clearly see the difference between the plates that count and between the survivors and uh, non-survivors. And similarly, this graph shows that the, when the, the severe the thrombocytopenia, the mortality goes up. Okay, so what could be the cause for thrombocytopenia and COVID-19 infection? So there are many causes that they have postulated. Uh, as, in, as in any viral infection, COVID-19 itself can cause uh, thrombocytopenia. And COVID-19 is well known to associate it with DIC, which is a, uh, another cause for thrombocytopenia. Also, as in other viral infections, uh, COVID-19 is also known to associate with antiphospholipid syndrome and immune thrombocytopenia, all are immune-related complications, which are causes for thrombocytopenia. Also, when the cytokine, cytokine storm sets in, uh, hemophagocytic syndrome can uh, uh, occur, which can, which is a cause for cytopenia. Also, these patients are treated with heparin, so if they might get heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. So uh, another cause would be the drug-induced myelosuppression, which can be caused by the antiviral drugs that are that is given to these patients. 
and uh, finally pseudothrombocytopenia is also a known uh, known cause because several publications show the evidence of edta induced aggregation platelet aggregation in these patients uh, you all know we collect uh, samples for full blood count in an edta sample which is the purple top tube so the anticoagulant there is edta and it's known there's known uh, reaction between EDT and platelets, which is again antibody mediated and uh, uh, which is more prevalently found in COVID-19 infection. So what happens here there is, so because of this application, the machine full blood count analyzer reads lesser number of platelets than what is actually there. So that's why we call it pseudothrombocytopenia. So uh, moving on to anemia. So anemia also can be seen, and it's thought that it's because of uh, COVID-19 uh, virus uh, attacking the beta chains of the hemoglobin. And reduction of this hemoglobin may adversely affect on respiratory uh, distress. The other main area would be coagulopathy. So changes can be mainly observed in D-dimer, fibrinogen, PT, and APTT. And, uh, it's well known that the COVID-19 infection is a thrombogenic condition and uh, one publication showed that there are three to six times higher rates of thrombosis uh, in COVID-19 infection. And the mechanisms that they think is because the inflammatory response uh, may disrupt the balance between the uh, anticoagulant and procoagulant pathway and uh, pro there, as a result, the procoagulant pathway get prominent, it's prominent. And also they have found the one variable factor is increased uh, in COVID-19 infection because of the endothelial damage. Why the endothelium get damaged? But they think it's because there are cells called pericytes beneath the endothelium, which contains ACE2 inhibitors. So these cells must, may, may be that or affected by COVID-19 COVID virus and which may in turn lead to endothelial activation and stimulation, also damage, which can lead to uh, a procoagulant status. So it is also found that PT and APTT can be prolonged in certain number of patients with COVID-19 infection. And also, more importantly, it is found that if there's an association between the uh, rising PT and APTT with the severity of the disease. Also, COVID-19 can affect liver, so PT is also a useful marker to assess the degree of liver failure. APTT prolongation uh, is also seen, and it's thought one reason could be the presence of uh, APLS antibodies. And also, APTT is used to monitor uh, the action of unfractionated heparin if patients are on. And however, there's no clear data with regard to the pregnant population, how these parameters behave in this among the pregnant uh, women. And this study shows uh, how the PT, if uh, the coagulation parameters like PT, APTT, D dimers, FDP, fibrinogen behaves among survivors and non survivors from this disease. So the survivors are. Um, uh, uh, shown in the blue lines by the blue lines whereas the non-survivors are shown uh, by the red lines so you can clearly see the non-survivors has had raised pta pt d dimers fibrinogen degenerative reproduct which is again uh, 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 something similar to d dimers and uh, fibrinogen all were elevated in non, among non-survivors. So there's a clear relationship between the elevation of these parameters with this disease severity. Okay, so moving on to D-dimer. So D-dimer is uh, increasingly being used in this uh, group of patients. And it is the more, it is far known, it's, it's found that it's most useful consistent marker for identifying the disease severity. And there are many publications to prove this fact. However, there are many reasons uh, for elevation of D-dimers among these patients apart from a thrombus. Uh, 
so infection inflammation itself can be a cause for ACE dimers and uh, renal failure can lead to uh, ACE dimers because D dimer is excreted by our kidneys. And pregnancy itself is a condition where you get high D dimer levels. And when pregnant patients admit with uh, coming with complications of COVID-19 infection, is baby survivable? Uh, they would subject the mother uh, to an emergency section to take the baby out. So some of these patients might be post LSES patients, which again a surgery or LSES may be a cause for raised D dimers. And another reason why these patients, COVID-19 patients, may get raised D dimers. Uh, they, because of the alveolar damage, they can get fibril deposition inside the alveoli. So a D-dimer is a sort of a, a degradatory product of fibrin. So when fibrin clot or fibrin uh, clot is degraded, these D-dimers can escape to the uh, bloodstream causing elevated D-dimers. So there are so many causes for elevated D-dimers. Therefore, you can see that it doesn't necessarily mean uh, or raised D dimer doesn't necessarily indicate the presence of a thrombus. So it has a poor positive predictive value, but if you get a low D dimer level, then you can safely exclude the possibility of having a thrombus. So it has a, in other words, it has a high negative predictive value. And so there are many publications saying that D dimer is not useful to diagnose thrombus, but it will be useful to exclude the thrombus. And especially in pregnancy, where a redime is anyway high, it's not useful to detect a trauma. So this study, which was done in UK among a small number of uh, pregnant mothers who are COVID positive and COVID negative, they have compared the uh, behavior of these hematological parameters among these two groups. And they have found there's a significant difference between hemoglobin, where COVID positive mothers have said, any uh, low hemoglobin compared to COVID uh, negative mothers. But there was a difference between platelets and other coagulation parameters except APTT, where APTT was uh, high among the COVID positive mothers. And this study is from uh, China, again compared small group of pregnant mothers versus compared, compared non-pregnant mothers who were all affected by COVID-19. And they have shown uh, there's a significant difference between the uh, absolute neutrophil count uh, among uh, uh, compared to non-pregnant mothers versus pregnant mothers. So obviously pregnant mothers will get neutrophil leukocytosis or neutrophilia as a physiological change. So you can't really uh, conclude that this is a COVID-19 related change or not, because this is anyway a physiological finding. Also, uh, they have failed to demonstrate any significant difference between the hemoglobin platelet and uh, the lymphocyte, uh, absolute lymphocyte count. So compared to the previous, but previous study, they have compared all the pregnant mothers who are COVID positive and negative. Here, they are comparing non-pregnant mothers versus pregnant mothers. And there's no significant difference between the platelet count and the hemoglobin. They haven't uh, studied coagulation parameters except D-dimer, which is again significantly raised in, among pregnant mothers. And uh, as I told, pregnancy itself is a condition where you get high D-dimers. So therefore, this doesn't surprise us. So you in a, now looking at these studies, uh, you can see, see that you really can't come to a conclusion uh, how these hematological parameters behave in pregnant mothers. I believe more studies needs with the large population. Okay, so uh, thrombosis, as I said, is much common um, uh, in, among COVID-19 patients, and it's more common among critically ill patients compared to uh, non-severe uh, uh, non disease. And this study has analyzed the, the nature of the thrombosis, and they have found VTE are much more prevalent compared to arterial thrombosis. And among these VTEs, more or less half were uh, pulmonary embolisms, and 15% were pulmonary embolism plus DVTs. So, uh, in other words, you can see that around 65% were. Uh, 
uh, uh, pulmonary related or has had pulmonary embolism. So they have found that there is a preponderance to pulmonary vasculature. Therefore, there is a new term coming up called pulmonary intravascular coagulopathy. As opposed to other diseases, so the, where you get DIC in other uh, the, I mean, in other contexts, you can see thrombosis everywhere or all over the body, or maybe there is no organ specific uh, preponderance. However, in COVID 19, you may see a preponderance towards the lung. So, this could be because of uh, because the primarily affected organ is lung, therefore, there is endothelial activation and damage in the pulmonary circulation, and these are critical ill patients may be. Had. Um, they are getting mechanical ventilation and CVP lines. So all can contribute towards um, uh, getting pulmonary embolisms. So this uh, study, uh, this uh, article uh, describes uh, the hypercoagulable status of the pregnancy mothers. So you all know pregnancy itself is a hypercoagulable status. So why this occur? Because the coagulation factors go up like factor 7, 8, 10, one milligram factor and 5 milligram, and the anticoagulant mechanisms go down. Uh, so they, you can observe decre decrease in protein S levels and acquired protein C resistance, so which will all cause uh, reduction in the anticoagulant pharmacy. Also, antifibrotic pathway also get uh, the, uh, re, uh, the prominences get reduced. So all these factors make the mother more hypercoagulable. So that is a physiological change uh, which is needed or which, uh, which uh, aid mother to face the delivery and the blood loss following the delivery. So uh, this study has evaluated uh, uh, thromboembolic complications among pregnant mothers, a systematic review uh, of, a six, of 69 papers. Altogether, there were above, above 1,000 pregnant mothers. And the, in conclusion, they say that the coagulopathy and thromboembolism are increased in pregnant mothers who are affected by COVID-19 infection. Uh, so how we are going to manage thrombosis? So if, there, if you have evidence of two, a thromboembolic event or if there's a higher suspicion, you need to anticoagulate them with therapeutic doses. And also there are some publications showing the benefit of escalating uh, up to therapeutic anticoagulation when there is evidence of coagulopathy or when there is raised D-dimers. Uh, because in other words, when there's severe disease, they found that there's a benefit of increasing anticoagulation to therapeutic levels. However, this recent two publications sort of uh, gives a different idea. This was this appeared uh, very quite recently in, in a new NEJM, and they what they have done is they have uh, compared uh, or they have analyzed more than two thousand patients who were having moderate disease as compared to severe disease, and they have randomizedly gave. Um, prophylactic dose and compare it with therapeutic dose. What they have found is those with moderate disease, uh, they have benefited with therapeutic anticoagulation, while uh, those have, who had severe disease benefited from uh, prophylactic anticoagulation compared to therapeutic anticoagulation. Uh, so, how would you administer from the prophylaxis in pregnancy? So this span, uh, the Spanish group recommends uh, to uh, give uh, thromboprophylaxis to all mothers who are uh, who admit with COVID-19 infection, and to continue with two weeks following discharge. And for postpartum mothers, they are advised to continue with up until six weeks. RCOG also recommends to continue uh, or to give low molecular heparin prophylactic dose when they are admitted and to uh, escalate it only following the MDT discussion. And they uh, advise to give prophylactic, uh, continue prophylaxis up until 10 days of discharge. For postpartum mothers, uh, it may uh, be continued up to six weeks even, depending on the uh, other risk factors of uh, thrombosis. 
Sri Lankan College of Obstetrician and Gynecologists also uh, adhere to a more or less similar policy. And apart from that, they uh, uh, also advise on TED stockings. And uh, they um, uh, also, they what another point that they highlight is to stop anticoagulation when the platelet count drops below 50,000. I believe this is a good number to stop anticoagulation, especially if the patient is on therapeutic anticoagulation. If it is prophylactic, uh, we can usually go up to 30, especially during this uh, COVID context. Uh, so you may continue it up until 30, uh, it drops up to 30. So finally, let me briefly touch on uh, VITT. Uh, this uh, is a sort of a rare occurrence you, uh, and reported following AstraZeneca and Janssen vaccine. And it's an idiosyncratic vaccine reaction and the mechanism is more or less similar to heparin induced thrombocytopenia and thrombosis where you get platelet activation leading to a, a thrombus. And it occurs about five to 20 days, eight days after the vaccination and usually occurs among young population. And it is so the, because of the mechanism is different or in other words, it's more or less similar to heat. Uh, it's not associated with other usual risk factors of venous thromboembolism. There and also studies have shown that the pregnancy is not a risk factor to get VITT, pregnancy or postpartum. So they advise to go ahead with vaccination irrespective of whether you're pregnant or in the postpartum period. Um, so uh, I think that brings to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And if you have any uh, uh, questions, I'm happy to take up. Thank you. So thank you, Nadishani, for that uh, elaborative, expansive, very informative uh, uh, discussion or the presentation on uh, COVID and management of COVID in pregnancy. So as we have finished all three presentations, now this is the question time. Uh, I have two questions. The first question goes to Dr. Manu Mulachandra, and this was uh, from Dr. Lakmal. And his question is, does the CAR T cells react with mature B cells, which has CD90? Over to you, Manu. Oops. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Right. Uh, yes. So uh, theoretically, uh, it can work either ways. That is, your CAR T's can recognize the normal T's, the normal B's, as well as the B cells can uh, recognize CAR T cells. But practically, that doesn't happen because all patients who undergo CAR T therapy before the CAR T cells are infused, they undergo a, a, a process called lymphodepletion. So they are treated with uh, fludarabine and cyclophosphamide, which are uh, very lymphotoxic uh, chemotherapeutic agents. So essentially before the CAR T's are infused, all your lymphocytes are knocked off. So the only CAR T's that are circulating, uh, sorry, the only lymphocytes that are circulating are the CAR T cells. So uh, on a, on a on in vivo, it doesn't happen, but uh, theoretically, both, it can happen. Both ways, it can happen. Yes. Thank you, Manu. Uh, the next question goes to Dr. Nadishani. And the question is not related to, directly related to COVID. Uh, this is, uh, this question is from Dr. Janaka. And his question is, what are the other infections which can cause lymphopenia? Now we know that uh, dengue is a well-known uh, viral infection. And now we just heard that uh, COVID also can cause. What are the other uh, causes of lymphopenia? Uh, I hope I, uh, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. 
Yeah, so the classic example that comes to my mind is HIV. Uh, apart from that, actually, uh, we have seen lymphopenia and other common respiratory uh, uh, I mean, uh, viruses that can cause influenza. Uh, so those are the viruses that actually comes to my mind. Uh, apart from that, TB is a non cause for lymphopenia. Uh, uh, I think uh, those are the commonest causes, the commonest infections that crosses my mind uh, uh, that can cause lymphopenia. Okay, thank you very much. And I also have one question that is for you. And we know that uh, the D, uh, we routinely do D-dimers and we all know that D-dimer levels can be elevated in COVID. And uh, in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, the D-dimers are usually used as a negative predictor of thrombosis rather than a positive thing, because there are so many causes uh, which can cause elevated uh, D-dimers. But in our COVID guidelines, uh, the COVID prophylactic guidelines, we know that uh, if uh, the D-dimer level is 10 times higher than the uh, normal cutoff. We ask them to put on, uh, uh, you know, on an anticoagulant. What is the rationale? Do, do you have any idea why we have done that? Well, uh, uh, actually, uh, I, we, according to the evidence that I found, there's, we really can't... Uh, as I said, it has a negative predictive value, but really, you can't really uh, come to a conclusion that there's a thrombosis just by the, just because of high D-dime. Of course, you may uh, think of, I mean, in the sense, uh, you may, um, well, how can I say that? Uh, think, uh, you can suspect the thrombus if the patient is not clinically that unwell, despite being well or despite being not unwell if patient is having d dimer Or in other words, if there are no other reasons for the particular patient to get high d dimers then of course you may suspect. And as I said, uh, with the initial suspicion itself, you may have to start on therapeutic anticoagulation without waiting for, for the uh, confirmation. So in that context, I would say yes. And But when, I, when it comes to pregnancy, where yeah, I work, I come across so many... Uh, raised uh, so many patients with raised D-dimers, but without any thrombosis, particularly because they are pregnant and they, sub they are uh, some, most of the time, if when they get back, they are subjected to LSCS. So obviously post of mother, post of mothers will get high D-dimers. So therefore, where I work, actually, I really can't come to a conclusive uh, uh, idea with high D-dimers, whether it's really, really related to thrombosis, especially when at the pregnancy uh, context. Have I answered this? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, and uh, there's another question, uh, again, that is for you. Some COVID patients shows thrombocytosis, especially during the hyperimmune phase. Would you recommend aspirin for those patients and for how long? No, according uh, to the evidence that I gathered, aspirin is not recommended. Uh, I would ask Manu also whether you have come across anything different, but according to the evidence that I have gathered, aspirin is not recommended uh, and uh, during, uh, but some physicians, uh, there has been an argument whether whether, whether to give uh, from uh, uh, aspirin, but I couldn't find any evidence. And also, uh, thrombocytosis per se uh, at that I, uh, in this context will be a reactive phenomena, so uh, it doesn't warrant uh, antiplatelet treatment at that moment. So, Manu, do you have uh, want to add anything? Yes, yes. I think I agree with Nadishani. Uh, there is no uh, good solid evidence to support the play for aspirin as thromboprophylaxis. And if I can just add something to your question, sir, what you asked about the D-dimers. Uh, so in the remap cap trials, Nadishani showed 
uh, she showed uh, that the moderate COVID group benefited from uh, therapeutic anticoagulation. So they actually looked at this group and this, this, uh, they checked their D-dimer levels. So they divided the ones who, were, who had high D-dimers and low D-dimers. If I remember right, it, the, the, the cutoff was about two times the upper limit. And the benefit of uh, therapeutic anticoagulation was seen in both groups. So which really emphasizes that there's no place of D-dimer levels to decide on the intensity of anticoagulation. And I think the uh, guideline was also uh, updated uh, recently, which took off the point uh, where we had kind of indicated that you can use D-dimers as a guide to the intensity of anticoagulation. Uh, Rohan, uh, can yeah, you hear can. me, Rohan? Yeah. Yeah, of this, course, yes. Uh, like uh, and, uh, aspirin, we usually use for the post-COVID, like my, my MIS-C, multi-system inflammatory syndrome, when the platelet count is very high, uh, we use aspirin, as, uh, as well as the D-dimers more than 10 times, even there's no uh, thrombosis, if there is cardiac issues, we start on uh, inoxaparin. So I think uh, for that purposes, uh, because they can come with Kawasaki like uh, disease in the multisystem inflammatory disorder. So in that sort of a cases, we use aspirin as a therapeutic, as, uh, 75 milligram. Like kids, we use, of course, three milligram per kg. So it's something like that. I agree with that point. Uh, so uh, in the cardiac, if there's a cardiac involvement, they usually uh, give aspirin, but not uh, uh, thrombocytosis per se. I have not seen uh, giving uh, the aspirin without any other comorbidities in the background. So in the absence of any other questions, uh, we are happy to wind up the session for that. So thank you very much for uh, the presenters for their excellent presentations and all the listeners for your patience listening. So thank you very much and uh, good night. And uh, we are going to have our inauguration later. <laughs>